resigned on the process. The owner of the said construction company will be appearing in court in November. The minister says the SIU is also working on retrieving the nearly 3 million rand that had already been paid. Since taking over at Human Settlements, she has been crisscrossing the country, establishing the state of the department. We, we have not done well in terms of the numbers, but we wish that we can improve. So we'll clean the system in terms of registration. We'll ensure that we have quite good database. I've been speaking about this and will improve the rate of delivery. Minister Kubai has slammed the idea that her presence in the different provinces is as a result of campaigning for the ANC. For News from Africa on Channel 405, I'm Lin Damnisi in Limpopo. To stay with us, in the next hour, we're in conversation with Peter Louis Maybach of Scorpio. He penned an article on Digital Vibes deal funneled uh, to May Nkise's farm loan, so he'll give us details uh, on that. We also speak to the executive mayor of Mfuleni, and that is Gift Mwerani. Watching Newsroom Africa, and this is Newsroom AM edition.
Health Minister Joe Patla says the country is not out of the woods just yet. In the last few days, the rate of COVID-19 infections has been hovering below 5%, signaling the end of the third wave. The minister is urging South Africans to remain vigilant against the virus. South Africans who have been vaccinated can now access digital COVID-19 certificates, which they can download online. Minister Joe Patla launched the vaccine certificate today to provide proof that individuals have indeed been vaccinated with a QR code which shows their COVID-19 vaccination status. And ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa and EFF leader Julius Malema take their local government election campaigns to the northwest. The clock is ticking for parents in Gauteng who wish to enroll their children for grade 1 and 8 next year. They have until midnight tonight to register. Hello again and thank you so much for joining us on Newsroom Africa Channel 405. We start with this. ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa is taking the party's local government elections campaign to the northwest today. Ramaphosa will be in Pochevstrom along national office bearers to garner support ahead of the November polls. The party says the president's visit to various parts of the province will also serve to explain the contents of the manifesto. Our reporter Nicholas Bauer is there this morning and is monitoring the situation for us in Potchefstroom in the northwest. Let's set the scene, Nick. What are we hearing and what are we seeing? Yes, good morning to you, Judy Zule. This is not going to be an easy assignment. Uh, not only are there a long list of service delivery challenges in areas in and around Potchefstroom, but also, it's a fact that the ANC has been suffering from factional challenges as early as 2013 here, with the municipality once upon a time being dissolved based on the fact that the ANC could not find a quorum within itself. So we're here gathered at the Methodist Church. As you can see, there's a fairly strong contingent of ANC members and also community members that are quite uh, curious as to uh, what the president will have to say. He's currently within the Methodist Church here in Ikaking, uh, Ikaking at the moment, uh, getting a briefing on the situation on the ground before doing a door-to-door -door campaign. And as we have our cameraman, Morena, follow me here, I'm going to go and take us through to Pule Mabi, the ANC spokesperson. I said to him that we will be uh, joining him in a moment or so. As we go right now, Pule Mabi has also been uh, getting a briefing from local community members. Pule, uh, it's not going to be an easy assignment today for the ANC. I mean, local government elections, it's going to be a, a hardly fought, hardly contested election. But as I've already said to our viewers, the ANC's suffered factional challenges in this part of the country for quite some time. Uh, well, uh, we have gone out of our way really to unite comrades here in the northwest. Uh, we are quite compatible with the work that they are doing. It's all hands on deck. Everyone seems to be focused on the local government elections campaign. Our structures are energized. We have got uh, election structures that are really doing work on a day-to-day -day basis. Where there are matters of disputes, which still need to be attended to, including, say, on candidate selection. We have set out a process that the electoral committee that is headed by uh, uh, Deputy President, uh, Comrade Khale Mamutanti, will still be seized with these issues, even beyond uh, elections. Members of the National Executive Committee, as you may know, are also going to be constituting a larger network of these uh, interviewing panels for mayor candidates who will have been part of an organizational process. So we are quite comfortable. Uh, so far, so good. What we have seen in all other provinces does suggest that there is a growing belief in the African National Congress and its ability to come back and to constitute councils that will be able to serve our people better. Belief is one thing, action is another one. We saw uh, on the way to the Methodist Church here in Ikaheng, there are serious service delivery challenges here, Pule. So how is the president going to convince voters to not only vote for the ANC but rely on the party to actually deliver post the 1st of November. You've been running a lot of these wards and a lot of these councils for a very, very long time, but still we see massive piles of rubbish, 
service delivery really non-existent in some sectors of uh, this township itself, Kaheng, what's the NC going to do about it? Well, uh, well the, the, the president is, is, is getting a briefing uh, from comrades on the ground, the ones that are really involved in uh, the work of municipalities, provincial government and all of that. And in that briefing, where there are challenges, acknowledgement is being made, and uh, a briefing is then put forward in terms of what they are, being, they, they are doing to deal with that. Whether it's on sewer, it's on waste, it's on electricity, and all of that. The ANC does acknowledge that there are instances where there's failing infrastructure. But we appreciate the fact that through the integrated development plans driven by these municipalities, there is an attempt to deal with the backlog. What is important is for our people to participate in those uh, forums where they are convened so that they do not only come in at a point of protest. They must also be able to say, this is the kind of a developmental path that we had put forward to Trokwe. We had raised that we need, a, we, we need a soccer field for the youth, so we deal with cancerism and all of that. We need a sewer spillage being dealt with, we need a waste being addressed, and all of that. Then when the municipality comes back, it is then able to reflect on what it has done to be able to deal with those things that are concerns of our people. Well, Pule, we'll wait with bated breath. Thank you very much for keeping us in the know here on Newsroom Africa. We'll wait to see what happens when President Sir Ramaphosa goes on that door-to-door -door around this community throughout the day. It's going to be in and around townships, uh, uh, we're in and around townships next to uh, Potterstrom. We're in Ikaheng at the moment. Uh, and we wait to see what is going to come out of this door-to-door -door campaign and indeed also the issues that are going to be raised at the community hall meetings that are happening later this afternoon. Duduzile. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Nicholas Bauer. We'll be right there with you to bring those developments for our viewers. All that and more coming up for you a little bit later on. On to this now. Health Minister Dr. Joe Pata has officially launched the digital COVID-19 vaccine certificate. He says this will provide proof for individuals who have been vaccinated and will be used to facilitate travel and access to establishments as well as gatherings. The minister this morning held a briefing updating the nation on government's interventions against the virus. The Center for Scientific and Industrial Research, uh, which uh, falls under the Ministry of uh, Science and Innovation, the minister played in Zimande's uh, ministry. And, what, and this is what, what we are launching today, as the team will, in, will uh, explain, it's, it's the first phase of the certificate. We say first phase because it is ready for use, but there's going to be a lot more improvements going forward in the next two months to improve, especially on the safety and security of the certificate. But it is ready for use. We expect that the certificate will be a tool to enable vaccinated people to access many opportunities, uh, which uh, various service providers will be making available. Dr. Patla says that South Africa has officially exited the third wave. He says this wave lasted over 100 days, with it being the worst the country has experienced. It's, a, it's a, with a deep sense of relief that I can say this morning to, uh, to all South Africans that uh, we have indeed uh, exited the long-drawn third wave. And when the president spoke to us last Thursday, he did mention this. Uh, indeed, we have exited the, the third wave, which, uh, as I've said, has been long drawn uh, from our scientists in terms of modeling and monitoring indicated that on the 27th of September, we uh, technically exited uh, the third wave, which is really very welcome information. This third wave has lasted much longer than the previous two waves, uh, over 100, uh, close to 110 days. Uh, and indeed uh, much longer than the previous waves. The uh, first wave, which was somewhere in the region of uh, 80 days, and then the next one around 90 days. So this one, well over 100 days. Dr. Patla says there are close to 9 million South Africans that have been fully vaccinated. He says the country is on track to meeting the target of vaccinating at least half of the population. The total doses administered thus far up to yesterday of uh, vaccines are now standing at uh, 18,735,000, very close to 19 million doses. 
uh, with uh, 13 million and 300,000 individuals vaccinated, uh, which is now we are standing at 33.4% of the adult population. So uh, this takes us almost uh, very close to half of the 70% because by the if uh, when we reach 35%, it will mean we'll be at half of uh, the 70% which we are aiming for. So at least we're getting close to half of that 70 at 33.4%. Well, South Africa is finally off the UK's red list from Monday. Citizens who wish to travel will no longer be required to quarantine for 10 days upon arrival in Britain. Travelers from South Africa, Brazil and Mexico will no longer be required to quarantine. This as the UK has cut the number of countries on its red list from 54 to 7. They will also have their vaccination status certificates recognized. Now that means they will avoid post-arrival testing requirements. The UK says this is part of the country's efforts to open up travel and boost the airline and tourism industries. Two more bodies have been retrieved from a ventilation shaft at Lawrence Park in Orkney in the northwest. This brings the total number of bodies to eight after six people were shot in an altercation between the police and illegal miners on Wednesday evening. IPID is investigating the cases. Our reporter Bafedile Muerane compiled this report for you. An illegal mining operation, a situation that has been prevailing for years now, with police failing to cap it, a group of gangs are fighting over old mine shafts in Orkney. This shaft belongs to the China African Precious Metal Mining Company. Since Saturday, over 500 illegal miners have been removed underground. An altercation ensued between the mine's private security, police and illegal miners after some wanted to force their way inside the shaft to provide food to those underground. 35 illegal miners have been arrested following the shootout. They are facing charges of attempted murder, causing an explosion, malicious damage to property and conspiracy to commit crime. The arrest came after a group of approximately 300 illegal miners, commonly known as Damazamas, attacked and shot at the security officers and later the police in an attempt to forcefully provide foodstuffs to their fellow illegal miners who were underground. The shooting incident that unfolded at around half past six in the evening led to the deaths of illegal miners. Four bodies were found in the vicinity of the shaft. One was found approximately 800 meters from the crime scene, while the sixth one was found in the bushes near Kanana location. Several food parcels and two firearms were found at the crime scene. The arrests and shooting incidents came after a decision by the mine management to close down the shafts while hundreds of miners were still underground. The arrests and shooting incidents came after a decision by the mine management to clamp down on illegal mining activities by closing the ventilation shaft which the Zamazamas had been using to enter and exit various shafts. The action effectively stopped the supply of foodstuffs and water to the Zamazamas. Consequently, some of the illegal miners voluntarily and due to shortage of food and water used explosives to open a hole and started to exit the shaft on Saturday 2 October 2021. On Sunday 3 October 2021, more than 500 had already exited the shaft. They were thoroughly processed, including being medically exam examined for dehydration before being released. Some were treated by paramedics while a few others were taken to hospital. The bodies are yet to be identified as they have been taken to the local government mortuary. For Newsroom Africa on Channel 405, I am Bafedile Moyarani in Orkney near Kekstop.
Police Minister Begi Kele will host an Mbizo in Mitchell's Plain today. The minister will be accompanied by his deputy Kassel Matale and top brass from the South African Police Services who will engage the community of Mitchell's Plain and address some of their concerns. So according to the latest crime statistics released by Mitchell's Plain Police Station, it featured as one of the top 30 stations in the province in various serious crime categories. Kele has has been traveling across the country, engaging communities that are struggling with crime. In a moment, I'll be joined by investigative journalist Peter Louis Maybach. He talks to us about more revelations on how former Health Minister Dr. Zuelin Kiza's family benefited from the Digital Vibes contract. Do stay with us. Hi, it's Dudu. Can you hear me? Good morning, Dudu. I can loud and clear. Awesome, Marie. Happy Friday. You too. So what's been the reaction to this? Yeah, you know, I think shock and awe, I suppose. Mm, mm. <laughs> it does look, like, um, does look like the story is continuing to give us some, some shocking revelations. So, yeah. It's a gift that keeps giving. Mm, quite, quite. Cool. We'll chat to you in a moment. Please stand by. Okay. Hello again. Some more revelations have surfaced about the Digital Vibes saga. A daily Maverick investigation has revealed that nearly 2 million rand from the Department of Health's Digital Vibes contract made its way into former Minister Dr. Zuelim Kize's wife's May Kize's loan account. And about 15 years ago, it reported that the state-owned Itala Development Finance Corporation granted an 11.8 million rand loan to Kize's wife to buy a farm near Peter Maritzburg. For more on this, I'm joined by investigative journalist Peter Louis Maybach. Peter, a pleasure chatting to you this morning. So this has been some work in progress. Uh, perhaps just set the scene for us in terms of how long it has taken uh, you guys in terms of your investigation to get to this point before we get into the meat of it. Yeah, good morning. Good morning to your viewers. So uh, you'd recall that we've been on this story since about February this year, actually late February. So that's uh, pretty much an eight months investigation at this point. And, you know, it certainly has been a case of, um, you know, slow progression in some sense. The types of financial revelations and dealings that we investigate are very difficult to, to uh, investigate uh, just by the very nature of these convoluted transactions that we reveal today. So it really has taken a couple of months. We initially uh, managed to obtain some information that allowed us to first expose that some of the digital vibes contracts proceeds were funneled to the Mkhize family. And now uh, subsequently to the involvement of the special investigating unit, which of course has far wider reaching powers than mine, the subpoena bank records and other financial details. They've now gone and confirmed that uh, even more monies that we, than we didn't initially identified had been funneled to the Mkhize family. And the, I suppose the big headline from the latest development is that the, the payment of uh, about 2 million rand nearly being funneled to the Tala Development Corporation to service that loan that the minister's wife, or former minister's wife, had obtained back in 2006. Uh, and of course, in your investigation, you do have an opportunity, um, you know, to get um, a right of reply from people that you are writing about. Curious to find out uh, whether she has perhaps confirmed that indeed she did receive this money and where did it go? Yeah, look, so Dr. Mayim Kize said she was not interested to discuss this matter, um, but she referred me to her son, the Donin Kize, and another uh, gentleman 
Mr. Proke Sokela, who is also involved in their farming activities in Peter Maritzburg. And they've essentially just denied that this is a manifestation of money laundering and the paying of alleged kickbacks. They maintain that these are kind of normal financial transactions between the Dhani Mkhizi and, and Mr. Proke Sokela, and that it's got nothing to do with the Digital Vibes contract which of course stands in kind of stark contradiction to the flow of funds which kind of very clearly shows and we've gone to um you know uh, quite a lot of effort to to, to really in, in uncertain terms and very kind of um you know visually illustrate how the money actually came from the department of health uh through these other entities mateta projects and serena trading before ultimately being deposited in the accounts of dr may mckeese or in a loan account, and then also in the, the business accounts of the minister's son, former minister's son, the Dani Mkhize. As you rightfully point out, you also illustrate um, where this money has gone, right? So perhaps for the benefit of our viewers who have not had an opportunity to take a look at this, talk us through where the money went and what it was used for. Yeah. Look, so essentially the money comes from the Department of Health in about 19 tranches were paid out throughout 2020 mostly and early 2021. Uh, the Department of Health in total paid Digital Vibes uh, 150 million rand and it would have kind of come through a varying amount, 7.8 million there, 17 million there. So as uh, Digital Vibes was invoicing the department, the payments were made to Digital Vibes and then Digital Vibes would uh, distribute some of these earnings to a range of what I call alleged slush funds including Mateta projects. So just by way of illustration, in October 2020, the Department of Health paid Digital Vibes 11.7 million rand. And then literally just two days later, Digital Vibes passed on 1.6 million rand to a company called Mateta projects. And then two days after that, Mateta projects forwards money to an entity called Cerilla Trading. And then Cerilla Trading pays money into the account of the Dani Mkhize's company, his farming venture, Tusa Kushle Farming. So, you know, we, we really kind of try to go to great lengths to very, you know, uh, very clearly and in no uncertain terms illustrate uh, that the, the funds we are talking about here relate to the Department of Health. They come from the Department of Health and it, it really puts us beyond any doubt um, that, that these are monies linked to that deal being siphoned off and illicitly paid to individuals who really shouldn't be receiving this money. Since there has been no comment from people that have been identified to have been beneficiaries uh, of these monies, when we follow the trail, the money trail uh, that is, do we have an idea of whether these monies were paid back since they were loans? Uh, yeah, that's always a good question. Unfortunately, we don't. So that would take a even follow a forensic, forensic examination that allows one to have sight of some of these agreements. But um, I can tell you that uh, as regards some of the payments that I've seen, Digital Vibes has not received any of the monies back that it's supposedly distributed as loans. And I assume the same could be said for some of these other entities, um, because normally in, in the course of our work, we do find that the, the supposed loan structure is a very convenient manner through which illicit funds are distributed to third party individuals and these loans routinely aren't, aren't uh, normally paid back. So just a, just a quick correction. So there has been comment from most of the individuals involved yet. Um, the Don and Kize and Protest Okela have denied that there is corruption despite these flow of funds. It's uh, just May Kize who at this point does not want to comment. And that was my next question to you, that we, well, you did speak to Dedanim Kize's uh, lawyer. Uh, what did he have to tell you? We understand uh, that there may be litigation here as well. Yeah, they, they claim they will litigate. Look, um, we've seen in the past that the individuals embroiled in these kind of scandals make a threat of litigation and do not quite follow up on that, uh, but possibly they might litigate. This, of course, also follows on earlier indications from Dr. William Kize, who said that he would also take the SIU decisions on review, so we are yet to see any such filings. Um, but essentially, the Dardim Kize's a lawyer uses a, a, a pretty strong language, calling the SIU's work preposterous, that's the one word he used, and it's just, its um, findings are supposedly unfounded. Um, he maintains that 
the Daniam Kizi and the other individuals weren't properly consulted. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly um, wait for any filings in that regard to, um, to, to really get a sense of what the legal argument might be to refute or challenge the discoveries the SIU has made. I may have missed it, so I beg your pardon. I'm curious to find out um, if Scorpio actually uh, had spoken to the former health minister, Dr. Mzueli Kizia, on uh, these latest revelations. No, look, so we routinely, as a way, of course, we do reach out to anybody implicated in these kind of uh, alleged wrongdoings and corruption. And these attorneys indicated that they would consult with him at in some point in the future. They, they couldn't... Um, they couldn't attend to our deadline. Um, so we will we'll certainly reflect any such comment should it ever come in in any future reporting. Louis, thank you very much. Uh, Peter Lou Maybach, uh, I beg your pardon. Thank you very much uh, for your time this morning. He's with the Scorpio at the Daily Maverick uh, on that article. You can head over to their website uh, to get more detail on it. On to this, Deputy President, Cyril, Deputy President David Mabuza, I do beg your pardon on that, has come out in support of President Cyril Ramaphosa's intention to suspend Police Commissioner Ketla Sitole. Mabuza says he's confident Ramaphosa applied his mind when he made the decision. Sitole's future as the National Commissioner hangs in the balance after the President served him with a notice of suspension. Sitole was invited to make representations on why he should not be suspended and has subsequently responded. The move came after a high court ruling found that Sitole had breached his duties in terms of the IPID Act by intentionally frustrating an investigation into the procurement of the controversial grabber device. Mabuza has dismissed allegations that Ramaphosa's decision was politically motivated. Still on that suspension, the South African Policing Union has labeled the president's move on Sitole as disingenuous. The union criticized Ramaphosa for taking his time to institute disciplinary action. If you talk about the seriousness of this case, when it became serious, because it took 10 months back, and we cannot afford a situation, and we must not be seen as if we are defending General Stolle. No, we are defending a principle. If General Stolle have to account for his action, he could have accounted as early as January because of the processes of court. They has not stopped the president from taking action departmentally so that you cannot leave a national commissioner with a dark cloud hanging on top of his head whilst he's leading the police and is the custodian of discipline in the police. But you leave him for 10 months with that, that cloud, and after 10 months, we are saying this matter is serious. When did it become serious? The Congress of the People has weighed in on this matter, calling for heads of both Sitole and Police Minister Becky Tele to roll. They say the lack of cooperation between the two is impending the work, impeding the work of the police. Said that the president must fire. Uh, both the Minister of uh, Police, uh, Becky Kale, and the Commissioner, because we cannot allow and have tension within the police. There is totally uh, no cooperation between the two. There's no relationship between uh, uh, Becky Kale and, and, and Ketlas Tole. So that's why we have said that uh, as early as last year already, that these two people are damaging the image of uh, the police. Uh, they must be fired. The Amazon royal family is confident that the feuds playing out in the public domain will soon be a thing of the past. Yesterday, some family members met with a panel appointed by the Provincial Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs Ministry. The panel, led by former KZN Premier Willis Mkunu, has been tasked with helping to end divisions among family members through mediation. Now, there are indications that the throne currently held by King Misizulu Kwazweli Tini is being contested by more than one heir. According to the Amazulu traditional prime minister, Prince Mangosutu Butelezi, the panel has requested an inclusive meeting with all factions of the royal family to iron out those issues. 
still to come. We are continuing with our local government elections coverage. We'll be speaking to Mfuleni Mayor Gift Mwerane. And we'll also be keeping an eye on ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa, who is taking the party's local government election campaign to the northwest today. At the same time, the EFF and IFP are in the same province. Those details in a moment. Yes, of course. Mr. Muerane, it's Dudu. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dudu. Look up. Stand by. Please stand by for us. We're coming to you shortly. Thank you.